please open your Bibles to chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. Chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. Just checking a couple things here before we get too far along. In the seasons of life, uh, it seems sometimes, you know, we learn that uh, death comes to all things, to all aspects of life. But the reality, and we learn this as Christians, we should actually learn this even from nature itself. Death does not have to have the final word, even in nature, right? The, the flower blossoms, it falls, the word of God lasts forever, doesn't it? We see the petals of the flower fall off and die, right? But it also drops its seeds, and those seeds will bring forth new life eventually. We see that that's the way with our, in the natural world. It's also true, certainly in the spiritual world. There's a lot about life and death and eternal life that the Lord wants to teach us, obviously throughout his word, but, but here in this chapter. And so we'll, we'll see how far we can go tonight before uh, I have to close this off. Uh, much of me would like to go on all night long. There's, there's a lot that I'd love to say, but I can't do that. And so um, we saw last week that the sisters, Martha and Mary, there are the three living in this town called Bethany. Bethany, just about two miles east of Jerusalem. Your Bible, if it's King James, says uh, 15 furlongs. If you know what a furlong is, you're probably spending too much time at the track. But uh, in any event, um, at about two miles east of Jerusalem, on the, on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives, overlooking the wilderness, the desert. And Jesus is over in a place called Perea, or Bethabara, and that's about 30 miles away, and a 4,000 foot elevation difference between Bethany slash Jerusalem on one side and uh, Bethabara, far off toward what we would call Jordan today. Uh, on the eastern side. And uh, Lazarus is sick. He's, uh, he doesn't have the sniffles. He's not just having a headache. This is not good. It doesn't look like he's going to do well unless there's some divine intervention. And a messenger is sent to find Jesus. Jesus receives the message, says, Lord, the, the one you love, phileo, like your friend, Lazarus, is sick. They don't give him a command, a demand. They don't, they don't tell him what to do. It's inferred that they believe that Jesus is just going to, to come and, and, or even speak from far away and that Lazarus will recover. Jesus replies to the messenger who now goes back to the sisters and says that this sickness will not result in death. Um, and so... And I have no doubt in my mind, I mean, I wasn't there and I don't know exactly what happened, but the way I see it, at least, is that um, Jesus, Jesus has said what he said in such a way that the messenger most likely said something like, Jesus said that Lazarus won't die. Well, now, what Jesus really did say is that this, this sickness is not unto death or that death won't have the final word. And we can try to split... Um, word hairs and theological hairs all day long. The bottom line is, uh, as I count the days, by the time the messenger got back to Bethany, which would have been about two days, Lazarus is already in the tomb. Jesus spends two more days in Bethavara, and then they head back. So that's a total of four days when we're going to learn that when Jesus and the, and the disciples come into Bethany, Lazarus has been in the tomb already four days. Uh, so uh, death is a death is one of those things that we just don't understand. We act like we do. Uh, sadly, so much of our media is wrapped up in death, murder. I mean, just all aspects of death, and yet we just don't understand death. And the reason that we don't understand death is that we were not designed to die. We weren't designed for death. We were designed for everlasting life. So there's not a thing about us that our software is not designed to handle this, I guess you could say. Where we're not designed to handle death. And so when it comes time for a funeral, there's just this 
strange disconnect, this tearing sensation that goes on in our beings. And we've all experienced, most likely, we've all experienced this. Um, D.L. Moody said it well. He said that uh, you can't really get good instructions from the Bible as to how to, um, how to design a funeral or how to orchestrate a funeral or how to conduct a funeral. Because in every case that Jesus appears on the scene, he foils every funeral there is. Uh, we've certainly seen that. Um, this is the third, uh, the, the third account of Jesus raising someone from the dead. There were others beside these three. Jairus' daughter up in, uh, in Capernaum, uh, who he, you know, he just, he walks into Jairus' house and Jairus and, and his wife, the little 12 year old daughter has, has died. Uh, he brings uh, Peter, James and John with him and they go into the child's bedroom and Jesus takes her by the hand, Talita kumi, he says, little one, arise. And she immediately arose. Jesus said, give her some food. Um, there's another interesting time also in the Galilee in the, in the town of Nain as Jesus is coming near the town and walking in the town just by the gate. Uh, now there's a, there's a funeral session, funeral procession happening. And here's a young man, uh, being carried out on a litter or the bier, Um, and Jesus stops the procession. He puts his hand on the young man. Now this woman, his mother, this is her only son, and she's a widow. So that means a lot in that society because she has no male support anymore. And he says, arise, and immediately the man gets up and begins talking, uh, which, frankly, for those of you who still remember Candid Camera, I remember a Candid Camera episode like this one time, where suddenly the, you know, the person in the... I can't believe they did this. Well, the more I think about this, when I was young, I just laughed at it. Now I think, oh my word, they did this at a funeral, in a, in, in a funeral home, where the person laying in the, in, uh, in the casket now sits up and begins talking to people. Yeah, this would really freak you out. See, when we read these things, we read these things like nice Christian people, and we don't, we don't, we're not shocked, we don't laugh at them, but this would have been astounding. And of course, a great joy, of course, to the ones, uh, the ones who love this young man. But um, so anyhow, uh, as we, we look at this, you know, we're, there are a lot of different aspects we can look at. We can look at, you know, What's it going to be like in the resurrection? How are the dead raised? What kind of a body are they raised with? We can look at some of that um, and for more reference, spend some time in 1 Corinthians 15. You know, there's a lot of chapters in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we refer to uh, chapter 12 as the spiritual gifts chapter. Uh, chapter 13 is often mistakenly, but in one regard, rightly, I guess you could say, called the love chapter. Um, chapter 15 is called the resurrection chapter. Uh, and, and it's a good one to study as we make our way toward Resurrection Sunday. So, of course, the question is, you know, why did Jesus wait? You know, I, I find this interesting. If you look at everything that's happening in the scripture sometimes as a, as a stage, and I, it's not a stage, it's, it's real life being played out, but, you know, you look at it, the stage and, and and Mary and Martha have no idea what's going on backstage. They don't see how the, 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 the props are being moved around. They don't know what's about to happen. The last thing they ever would have thought is that Lazarus is going to be raised from the dead. But uh, these are the things we don't see, the backstage of heaven. But so the question is, so why does Jesus wait? Why does Jesus wait four days from the time he receives the message? Of course, the Lazarus is already alive by then. Or excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry. Lazarus has already died at that point. But nevertheless, why does Jesus wait? Well, Jewish belief, according to Talmud, uh, Jewish belief in those days, this is not biblical, okay? Not a biblical belief. It's a, it's a, it's, it was their religious belief. Uh, the belief of, of, of the Jews was that the soul stayed around the body after death for three days. By the fourth day, the soul would leave. Um, now, some people say that's when decomposition began. If you've been around death in any way, if you work in the medical field, you know this. Uh, if you... <laughs> 
if you're in my line of work, so to speak, you know, you've seen this. Uh, decomposition begins pretty quickly, and I won't go through the gories with you right now. But um, but certainly by the fourth day, things are things are moving pretty rapidly um, and pretty effectively. So why did Jesus wait? Well, the fourth day was the day where it was beyond comprehension that anybody could ever come back from the dead. Um, and the only reason anybody ever came back from the dead prior to that, frankly, was because they hadn't really died. Right? And so... Um, so why did he wait? Because Jesus intended to show his power beyond the grave. Um, I mentioned to you, you know, the widow of Nain's son, uh, Jairus' daughter. There's, there are examples of this, and of course we know that he did more than this. Jesus did more than this. But um, So we come to this point, and let's pick up in verse... Uh, No, we're just going to pick up at verse 17. We left off in verse 16 on Sunday. So now we read, as they come toward Bethany, they made a very stiff hike from Bethabara up to Bethany. Then when Jesus came into Bethany, he found that he had already, that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, uh, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother Lazarus. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and she met him. But Mary remained sitting in the house. I want you to process what Martha has to say to Jesus here. So Martha said to Jesus, verse 21, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Now, one, one factor that we don't have when we read the printed word, we don't have, what was the tone of voice? What, how did Martha say this? Now, we all have a sense, probably, from, from how we've come to know Martha a little bit, that um, Martha can be quite demonstrative. That's apparently so. Um, we have this sense. I tend to have this sense. Doesn't mean I'm right. She might have gotten up in his grill a little bit. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But she's an interesting picture, Martha. She's a picture of most of the rest of us, of the faithful followers. We know the right thing to say. Now, we have our emotions, but we know the right thing to say. We're torn between the two realities. The reality of knowing that no one's ever died in Jesus' presence. If, if he'd been here, Lazarus would not have died. And yet at the same time, we know that God will give him anything that he asks. And I cannot explain to you exactly what she meant by this statement. Lord, if you'd been here, verse 21, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. Even now, even now after four days, that's I mean, that's a pretty uh, powerful statement. Um, even, even now, after four days, I know that God's going to give you anything that you ask for. Jesus' response, your brother, he says, will rise again. Now, now mark this. See, Martha, like you and me, we know, a many of us, we know our theology. We've been in church enough to know the right answer, we know what the Bible says about certain things. And so we have some pretty pat views of things. She says, she says, Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And, and Martha said to him, I know, I know, he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, you don't have to go there, but let me just read for you. In Daniel chapter 12, and uh, Jesus had made mention of this in John chapter 5, uh, we see reference to this in a number of places throughout the Word of God. There was a belief, a solid biblical belief, understood Old and New Testaments. There was the understanding that there is a general resurrection coming. And, and it says uh, right here, um, uh, Michael uh, or rather, excuse me, uh, Gabriel tells 
Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The sense of the general resurrection, and there is a general resurrection. So when, when Jesus says your brother will rise again, Jesus means something different than what... Martha is not prepared for what's about to happen. It sounds like she's asking for it, but for, as we process through this, we can tell that she was not prepared for this. Um, so every Jew believed in a general resurrection. Martha believed in this general resurrection. We see it also in uh, Job chapter 19. He says, after my sin is destroyed, he said, I will stand upon the earth and I will see my redeemer standing upon the earth. After my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh, I shall see God. He's not saying I'll be in heaven floating on a cloud. Not that we float on clouds. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. And I'm going to see God in some ethereal sense. No, no, he means he's speaking of a resurrection. There's been this understanding of a resurrection from the very beginning. That each person will receive a new resurrected body. Those who, those who are resurrected to everlasting life will receive these new glorified, resurrected bodies, and those who have refused God in their lives will receive indestructible bodies so that they will never perish in hell. Both cases we receive permanent, new and permanent bodies. And so, and uh, we could we could spend some time, and we probably don't have time for it tonight, so I recommend that you spend some time in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, but here, here's a quicker one that I'll go to. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait, await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that they may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue even all things to himself. That God is going to bring this transformation to these bodies one day. I love this passage. And of course, the more you think about it, the more you try to ponder it, the wilder it is. First uh, John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, um, Actually, verse 2, I should say. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we do know that when he, Christ, is revealed, we shall be like him. We'll have bodies like him, for we shall see him as he is. In other words, you won't be able to see him as he is without these new bodies. And everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself even as he, Christ, is pure. And so when, when Jesus says, your brother will rise again, Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Well, Martha, you're right. But then Jesus said, I'm the resurrection. Whoa. Not just a resurrection someday. Jesus is saying, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Even even though we die in these bodies, we will live again, if you know Jesus Christ, as your Savior. This is the fifth of the seven I am statements of Jesus. We talked on Sunday about the, um, the seven signs of Jesus. This is the last of the seven signs. And here, it's the fifth of the seven I am statements, right? And when he says, I am, ego am me in Greek, but he's really claiming to be the voice of the burning bush. Jesus is claiming to be the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Remember he said in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, he said, I'm the light of the world. In John chapter 10, he said, I am the door for the sheep. Uh, later on, a couple verses after that in John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Here, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father, he says, except through me. John chapter 15, Jesus will say, I am the vine, the true one. Seven times in John's gospel, Jesus is going to declare that he's, he's the God both of the Old and uh, of the Old Testament as well as being the Savior from the New Testament. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. He says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? See, there's the, there's the fact. You have to believe it. It's really quite simple when you boil it all down. And it's great for sharing with your friends and your relatives and the people you don't know. The invitation is broad. It's for everybody. Whoever believes. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. The invitation is broad. It's for everyone. The requirement is really quite simple. Believe. You must believe. You must place your faith. Not just say, oh yeah, there's a factoid about Jesus out there. And if I just check off that box, I'm good. No, no. Give him your life and follow him. And the benefits are eternal. You'll never die. So there's the question. Do you believe this? Lazarus died. Many people die. Everyone dies in one regard, right? In fact, the Bible says there are two deaths. And you don't want to live, you, you don't want to experience the second death. We each will die once. That's when these physical earth suits will give in. They'll just sort of, or I should say, give out. Uh, it won't be, whether it's organ failure, it's a disease process, there's a lot of different reasons that this body can give out. But it's going to happen to each one of us at some point. But if you're born again, you only die once. But you'll live twice. You'll live forever after, after this, in a glorified body, a brand new body, and not just in a place called heaven. I think that's one of the areas we miss out so often in church. We Pastors don't spend time talking about what happens after heaven. There's an everlasting kingdom. The first part of it is a thousand years long, and that's coming upon us very soon. And then after that, there's a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, and we'll live with him forever. Not in a cloud in heaven somewhere, but in a more in, in a more real sense, a real form of this body than ever. Do you believe this? I'm the resurrection and the life, he says. Do you believe this? Okay. Let me um let me try to work through some some of these verses here. Um he says, verse 27, she said to him, well, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ. I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. I mean, she did believe. you got to give her credit for that one. Martha understood that. She's got her theology. In fact, you go back and you compare that to Matthew 16, 16, where Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? And then after the disciples gave a lot of different responses as to what people think about him, then he said, Who do you say that I am? What did Peter say? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Right? So in that regard, you got got to give Martha a lot of credit because she understood that. She, She got that. And when she had said these things, Martha went her way. And she went and she secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come, and he's calling for you. You know, I have to tell you, that's something that you can say to every single one of your friends. You know, the master has come. He's come into this world. And he's called for me. And he's calling for you. He wants your life. He wants to forgive you of your sins. He wants to grant you everlasting life. It's such a simple thing to say. The master has come. He's calling for you. 
You know, Christians are mistaken for a lot of things. And sadly, nowadays, uh, it's because we give people the reason of thinking those, or misthinking those things about us. We're Christians. We're born again. If you're a true Christian, you're born again. We're no longer of this world in the sense that we once were. Christians should not be known by, you know, blowing up abortion clinics or bombing federal buildings or bashing homosexuals or these types of things. And at the same time, I just have to say what we certainly don't need to be known as, as, as people who place social justice ahead of the Bible. People who place critical race theory ahead of the Bible. Who interpret the Bible through social justice or through the lens of critical race theory. These are the things of our age and it's, and it's sad, it's sick. Jesus, our Messiah, is, has not come to bring Marxism to our world. He's come to grant forgiveness of sins, everlasting life, and to usher in a brand new kingdom where he alone is the king, and the king of kings, and the lord of lords. The greatest news that the, the world can ever hear is that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in him will live even though they die. People say so often, well, <laughs> how do I know? Well, look, Suppose you live your whole life. If I live my whole life, I've been, it's been more than 40 years since I've really been seeking to walk with Jesus Christ. And if I were to die today and find out that the things that I believed in were not true, what have I lost? More hangovers? More aspects of my life that were ruined? But for those who've refused Jesus Christ, saying, that's a bunch of bunk. I don't believe that. You die and you find out that you were wrong all along. What have you lost? Absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. Don't do it. Don't let it happen to you. But give your life to Jesus Christ today. If you've been waffling in your faith, it's time to get it straight and walk with him. It's time to get it straight and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, okay. So, uh, she says, the teacher has come. He's asking for you. And, and uh, as soon as Mary heard that, we read that she rose quickly and she came to Jesus. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town. He was still in the place where Martha had met him. In other words, he's, he's at the edge of town by probably the gate of the town. Every, every city, every village had its own little gate in those days. Uh, it was important, of course, uh, for security. Um, and, and now he, he's there, and Mary comes to meet him there. The Jews, verse 31, the Jews who'd been with her, Mary, in her house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and that she went out, follow, they followed her, saying, she's going to the tomb to weep there. Then, now watch this. This is interesting to me. You can compare this to what Martha had to say. Mary says here, verse 32, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him. She fell down at his feet and she said to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. You know, I, and I want to be careful because I, I don't know exactly how Martha said this. But do note that if you compare this to, to what Martha says in verse 21, they're word for word the exact same statements. But I have to believe because the women are different and their, their characters are different. They both love the Lord. They both worship him in different ways. It does seem that Martha is quite demonstrative, that she sort of got in his face, perhaps. Lord, if you'd been here, almost like a rebuke, a reproof. If you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But here's Mary, falls to her feet, or excuse me, falls to his feet, at her knees, probably in a, in a mess of tears. And through those tears, what's she saying? 
saying, she's, she's crying these words out. Lord, if, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Incidentally, we, of the three times that we see Mary here in the scripture, we see her in Luke chapter 10, where Martha's busy doing the work, preparing the meal and all that, and Mary is at Jesus' feet. Here, John chapter 11, she falls to her knees at his feet. Over in chapter 12, we'll see that she's at his, at his feet on her knees, and she's pouring a pound of spikenard out on his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. In each case is how she's worshiping him. She's always, that's her posture on, on her knees. Lord, if you'd been here, she says, my, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, we're told here that he groaned in the spirit and he was troubled. You have this, um, this idea, this groaning idea. Uh, it's almost like, some people would say, like anger. Um, there was this anger going on in him. And um, he, not that he was angry at her, but rather that he, there, was, there was an anger about him. Uh, almost like you get this word and you also see it in, in Hebrew. This word is uh, related to a horse blowing air out its nostrils. So he's groaning in spirit. There's this anger. So what's that about? And it also says that he was troubled or he's agitated. And so the sense that we receive here is that, is that he's, he's, he's troubled, he's angry. About what? Well, not about people. It's about death. See, you and I don't understand death. Because we were designed for everlasting life. Sin came in the world and destroyed that part of us. Only being born again helps to connect us, so to speak, back again, to, to repair that broken part of us. And even so, we don't really understand death. But, but so here's Jesus, I would say, weeping as he saw the power of death taking over his friends, taking over the people that he loves so much tearing apart their lives. Jesus, who knew better than anybody else and knew exactly what he was about to do, nevertheless, he's weeping. And of course, the response of, of others is, uh, see, how they, see how he loved him. See what, what kind of friends they were. Jesus says, where have you laid him? She said, come, Lord, and see. And some of them, verse 37, some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind, could not this man have kept this man from dying? Well, that's, that's a good question, isn't it? Could he have done this? You know, we, um, people can get pretty cynical about these things sometimes. If God is really a God of love, why does he allow so much pain and suffering in the world? Well, I'm not going to go into all of that tonight. It's because of a general thing called sin in the world. Now, some people don't like it when you say that to them, but it's good to, to graciously turn that around. If there is no God, if there is no source of good and moral, then how do you explain the good and the love and the right things that happen in this world? Without God, you can't explain good or evil. Only with God, the God of the Bible, can you explain right and wrong, good and evil. That's the only way that you can do it. And Jesus understands our struggle. Here he is. He's, he's weeping. You know, um, we read this in, in Hebrews chapter 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. This, I'm beginning in verse 14 of chapter 4 of Hebrews. Seeing then that we have a great high priest 
one who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, then let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was rather in all points tempted, just as we are, and yet he was without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly. That's how we're told to come. We're invited to come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. We're to trust God because he understands what you're experiencing. He feels the things that you feel. He feels the, the pain that plagues all of our souls. Jesus wept, says verse 35. It's a pretty wild concept. It really is. There's a number of places you can find in Scripture, not many, a couple places. We read that Jesus wept, Matthew 23, we read it in Luke 19. Think of the heart of the Father. Uh, I find this interesting to, to consider, the heart of the Father. After Adam and, and Eve died, and the Lord seeks them out, and they're hiding among the trees in the Garden of Eden. And, and Adam and Eve had, had done the one thing God said don't do, right? God said, you can eat of anything here. Every single thing that grows, I have planted here for you. You can eat its fruit. But do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And we know what happened, right? The, the serpent beguiled Eve. She ate it, then she gave it to Adam. He ate it, and they died. Now, they didn't die physically. They died spiritually. They didn't commit physical suicide. But they did commit spiritual suicide that day. And their lives were never the same. Though they lived hundreds of years before they physically died, what they experienced, the bitterness that they experienced in life for all those centuries was because of that one choice, to disobey God in that regard. Jesus here, wrenched in his spirit over the ravages of sin, pain, and death that were now happening to his friends, but to all mankind, Jesus wept over that. Which in the heart of the Father, as he goes seeking Adam and Eve as they hid from him amidst the trees of the garden, the father crying out, Adam, where are you? Adam, a father who loves his son, who loves his daughter, where are you? I'm looking for you. The, the voice, try to, try to think of it in terms of voice, the voice of a broken-hearted father. I know some of you understand some of that. Could not this man, could not this man, who opened the eyes of the blind man, the man born blind, couldn't he have kept this man from dying? Yes, he could have, but he had a greater purpose. He had a higher purpose. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and it says that a stone was in front of it. Now think of the weeping. You ever thought about this? We read in Isaiah 53, for he was a man of sorrows, Isaiah tells us, who was acquainted with grief. But he didn't keep himself from those sufferings that he bore for you and for me. That's the heart of the Father, that he would pour out that suffering upon his Son so that you would never have to experience it the pain of being separated from him forever. They came to the tomb, and it was a cave, this tomb, and a stone was lying against it. Let me just try to give you a quick picture here. In those days, uh, they would take a body, they would wrap it up uh, you know, with oils and, and, and fragrant spices to keep the stench down, basically. And then they would wrap the body a certain way at the knees, at the ankles, um, at the, you know, the arms to the side, they would wrap the body and, again, put all those spices over it. 
and then they would place the body on a shelf that had been carved out of a, uh, in this case, a cave wall. Uh, and that, that kind of a tomb was called a sarcophagus, which is, I guess that's a Greek word, um, or it's Aramaic, but I think it's Greek, sarcophagus, which means a flesh eater. Sounds yummy, right? But a flesh eater, the idea in, in the Middle Eastern climate, in the, in the heat and humidity, and the humidity of the tomb, because you know most of the stone was limestone for the most part, which is high in moisture content, um, decay would happen rather quickly. So after a number, or really a couple of years, not much at all, there would be no nothing left but bones. Flesh would be gone. And then they would sweep the bones into a much smaller box called an ossuary, a bone box. And then they would put it up on, on the shelf. So here's... Uh, Uncle Sid, Aunt Roberta, you know, Cousin Charlie, etc. right? Mom and Dad in their individual boxes. Um, so that's the case here. So then they come to this tomb, this cave. Lazarus is in there. There's a stone against the tomb, to basically to keep grave robbers away, but also to keep uh, the stench down. And they came to the tomb. A stone was laying against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, she said, Lord, you can't beat the King James here. I got new King James. It's just not the same. In King James, Martha said, Lord, by now he stinketh. <laughs> I'll bet sooner than this too. But um, by now the, he's, it says there's a stench for he's been dead four days. Jesus said, did I not say to you, that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. Could Jesus have moved the stone? Yes, but he wanted someone else to do it. I'm going to show you this in a bit. And Jesus lifted up his eyes. He prayed to heaven. He prayed to his Father in heaven. He said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. He said, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I have said this so that they may believe that you sent me. And now Jesus is going to make a command on the basis of the will of the Father. And when he had said these things, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Why loud? Because he wanted the crowd to hear. Okay? Lazarus, come forth. And I don't know who said it first, but someone said long ago that if he hadn't said Lazarus, then the whole cemetery would have been emptied out. And, and actually, there's a lot of truth to that. But in any event... Um, why, why was it loud? So that the crowd would hear. Why Lazarus? So that it would be only Lazarus. And so, and he commanded, come forth, because that was the command. Come out of there. And out came Lazarus. Now let me tell you, Lazarus did not look anything like he would have just moments before that. Moments before that, Lazarus didn't bear much resemblance to the Lazarus everybody had known four days earlier. And I can't imagine what it was like in heaven. He's been in heaven for four days. Four days. The people he's hanging with, he's talking to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, David. I mean, the people he's, he's with, he's visiting with his mom and dad. And who's the angel? The poor guy who has to go to him and kind of tap him on the shoulder and say, uh, Laz. Sorry, but um, there's a recall. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Uh, yeah, I know, I know, but Jesus is commanding it, and it's important. You got to go. And suddenly, I mean, nothing you can do about it. He's back in his body, and he's still bound, hand and foot, in these grave clothes. He's still bound, hand and foot, in his grave clothes. And he who had died came out. The stone has been moved. Jesus has called out, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out in his grave clothes, bound hand and foot 
in his grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Now, that was powerful. And, we, and you can read it for yourself later because we're going to have to end here. But as we go forward through these coming verses, when the scribes and the Pharisees learned that Lazarus has been raised from the dead, they actually seek to kill Lazarus. This, this is stark raving crazy as far as I'm concerned. But then that's when you know that these guys, these guys are just, they're, they're out for their own reputation. They got to get rid of every, every, every aspect of Jesus, all the good that he's done. They're going to, if they have to, they will kill, they'll kill Lazarus and they're out to do that. But it's also a really interesting picture as we end here. It's an important picture in terms of our spiritual walk. You know, we come to Christ, and if you know anybody in your life right now who's recently come to Christ, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a stone that's been rolled over their grave. And they've been living a life of a dead man or a dead woman. And they've come to Christ, but someone's got to help them. They've got to remove that stone, that there would be repentance, so they would come forth and breathe fresh spirit, fresh spiritual air, so to speak. But they're still bound hand and foot. There's still a grave clothes on them. And Jesus says, remove those grave clothes. You know, there's a lot of Christians walking around, and they even attend our church at times. It's happened to all of us. We're still living in the grave clothes of our previous lives, our lives up to Christ. And we're confused, and we confuse others in the process. Jesus says, remove those grave clothes. Remove those things that, that bind their hands so that they can serve others. Remove the binding on their feet so that they can move, that they can bring the good news to the world. They can serve the world. And remove the covering from their face so that they can make eye contact, that they can speak the truth that Jesus is the one who gives new life. It's time for each one to make sure that we've removed every trace of our old lives and that we're living the life of a person who's now born again.